Well, this is lecture 105 on the Iberian slave stage and uh, in the series The ABCs of Communism which accompanies and it will be in support of volume 7 on communism in Europe. We've gone through the primitive communist phases and we've gone through the chiefdom phases for all of the West European countries and uh, for that matter some of the East European countries and Russia as well. And now we're going on to the first kingdoms in the on the Iberian Peninsula and that's the beginning of the Iberian slave stage um, and the first one I want to talk about is the uh, kingdom of Tartessos, T-A-R-T-E-S-S-O-S. -S -S. Now 4,000 years ago the first kingdom of Spain's slave stage arose from an ATC, that is an advanced theocratic chiefdom, in the peninsula's southwest. Its capital was Tartessus, <coughs> a harbor city on the south coast of the Iberian Peninsula in modern Andalusia, Spain, at the mouth of the Guadalquivir River. It appears in sources from Greece and the Near East starting during the first millennium BC, that is, writers of that period. Herodotus describes it as beyond the pillars of Heracles in the Strait of Gibraltar. Roman authors echoed the earlier Greek sources, but from around the end of the millennium there are indications that the name Tartessos had fallen out of use and the city may have been lost to flooding. But the important factor for us is that the enabling factor for high ranks of the Tartessos ATC to become classes lay in the ability of some to make profit centers from trading with the rest of the Mediterranean world. This was the primitive capital accumulating germinal of mercantilism from which wealth would be acquired in that diagnostic way that is swindling. And you'll recall that uh, the traders of the of southern Mexico moving between Yucatan and central Amer uh, Mexico were able to supply the Mayan kingdoms there and chiefdoms with uh, salt, hard stone, and obsidian that was not native to their area. And in exchange they were able to take many things that uh, were desired in uh, central Mexico. And they, they were the only ones that were knowledgeable about what the value of the cargo and purchases were at both ends of the trading venture. Well in this case, in the East, uh, Western Mediterranean, the merchant mariner knows the value of his cargo and purchases at both ends of the trading venture, and those buying and selling said merchandise do not. So aboard ships loaded with trade goods, the burgeoning bourgeois rank, soon to be a class, could maintain a permanent maritime armed force, marines in other words, to protect these ships and their cargo. With armed force in their very private class hands, the state, that is the army and police, had arisen de facto in much the same fashion as the Mexo Mesoamerican Calpulli traders carrying goods between Yucatan and central Mexico had acquired their private armies. Anyway, from this maritime de facto state emergence, it was only a hop, skip, and socio-cultural jump to putting these professional payroll thugs onto the land and establishing polities. Accordingly, archaeological discoveries on the Iberian coastal regions shows what we should consider the first slave stage kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula. These kingdoms, including Tartessos, arose in the contemporary Spanish province of Huelva. Here are found 97 inscriptions in the Tartessian language a gold treasure was found called El Carambolo in Camas, two miles west of Sevilla, several, or Seville. Hundreds of artifacts are found in the necropolis at La Jolla, Huelva. At its maximum extent, the kingdom of Tartessos held sway over most, if not all, of western Andalusia, Extremadura, and southern Portugal, from the Algarve to the Varalopo River, and the Vinalopo River, in Alicante. Then archaeological survey combined with philology and literature gives our picture of the fully class divided 
state-organized Iron Age for the adjacent Mediterranean basin. It was inevitable now that irreconcilable contradictions had to emerge, that is, contradictions among the ruling classes and between the ruling classes of society and the mass of producers. As Frederick Engels said in 1884 in the book The Origin of the Family Private Property and the State, to paraphrase, quote, the state, that is the army and police, arises as the product of irreconcilable contradictions in society, placing itself above society, unquote. The most pr profitable primitive accumulators of capital were Tartessian cargoes of gold, silver, copper, and tin. The Greek historian F. Forrest describes a very prosperous market called Tartessos with much tin carried by the river as well as gold and copper from Celtic lands, quote, unquote. Now, by that, Celtic lands, he meant Brittany, Cornwall, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, and the Isle of Man. Trade in tin was very lucrative in the late Bronze Age, since it was an essential component of true bronze, and comparatively rare. Herodotus refers to a king of Tartessos named Argantho-Thonios, who possessed much silver and great wealth. The mercantile capitalists of Tartessos became important trading partners of Phoenician mercantile capitalists who founded a harbor trading post called Gadir, now Cadiz, near Tartessos in 1104 BC. The mode of production. Alluvial tin had been panned in Tartessian streams from an early date and evolved into full-scale mining of silver ore. Trade assumed an increasingly broad economic role. By the late Bronze Age, silver extraction in Huelva province reached industrial proportions. Silver slag found in the Tartessian cities of Huelva province produced 15 million tons of pyrometallurgical residues at the vast dumps along the Rio Tinto. Mining and smelting was undertaken from the 8th century BC. The spread of the silver standard in Assyria increased its attractiveness because tribute from Phoenician cities was assessed in silver. The invention of coinage in the 7th century BC spurred the search for bronze and silver as well, and this served a market among Phoenicians and Greeks. Scholars have named this orientalizing phase in Tartessian material culture from 750 to 550 BC, before Tartessian culture gave rise to the classic Iberian kingdoms leading to the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. Artifacts of Tartessian manufacture have been associated with the city of Tartessos in the center of modern Huelva, as have potsherds of elite painted Greek ceramics of the first half of the 6th century BC. Huelva contains a large accumulation of imported elite goods and must have been the most important Tartessian center for manufacturing. Medellin on the Guadiana River revealed an important necropolis. Elements specific to Tartessian culture are the late Bronze Age fully evolved patterned burnished wares and geometrically banded and patterns of carambola wares and these date from the 9th to 6th centuries BC. Then we have an early orientalizing phase with the first Eastern Mediterranean imports beginning about 750 BC. It's followed by a late orientalizing phase with the finest bronze casting and goldsmith's work. Gray ware turned on the fast potter's wheel being mass produced for commoners and there is a local imitation of imported Phoenician red slip wares. Characteristic Tartesian bronzes include pear-shaped jugs, often associated in burials with shallow dish-shaped brassiers with loop handles, incense burners with floral motifs, fibulas, both elbowed and double spring types, and belt buckles. The changes from a late Bronze Age pattern of circular or oval huts scattered on a village site into rectangular houses with dry stone foundations and plastered water walls 
took place during the 7th and 6th centuries BC. Settlements with planned layouts succeeded one another on the same site, including at Castulo. And Castulo was an Iberian town at Bishopric, located in the Andalusian province of Jaén, in south-central Spain near modern Linares. Farmers evolved into an ATC at Castulo from what had been the tribal agricultural home of the Oretani. In the early and middle Neolithic, they had settled north of the Guadalquivir River in the beginning of the 6th century BC. And according to oral history, a local princess named Himili married Hannibal, gaining the alliance of Castulo with the Carthaginian Empire. At Castulo, a mosaic of river pebbles dating at the end of the 6th century BC is the earliest one in Western Europe. Latifundia are the second big capital accumulators. Meanwhile, the new class-ruled, state-organized urban centers extended their control over the local less well-armed or unarmed farming families, forcing them to pay taxes to the new city-state polities. Great wealth was accumulated by the ruling families in this way, who soon had title deed to the land, and in some cases to the people living on it as well. This latter form of servitude was the origin of a class of slaves in Iberia, and that was important to maintaining a cost of labor as a common denominator, the slave families being paid only enough to keep them alive and reproducing. This meant that the still free farming families had to compete against the cost of labor, keeping their income nearly as low. And that payment that I referred to uh, comes in the form of food and housing. This was an early Iberian equivalent to the Confederate poor white trash, a term invented by Union soldiers entering the slave states during the U.S. Civil War. These Andalusia polities were abandoned in the 5th century B.C. because of internal class struggle, the masses wanting a return to earlier and supposedly better days. In Iberia's late Bronze Age, the masses of farmer families exhibited a typically peasant domestic mode of production. On top of them here and there, wherever the exploiters could still rule in smaller fiefdoms were the ruling families and their boss hierarchy. Thus the slave stage in Iberia arose in those parts of Spain and Portugal first, where maritime profit centers allowed the creation of capital in private hands, capably armed to, the, to rule over the mass of commoners. And these profit centers were the maritime trade and the farming estates in ruling class hands. Now, we go to the city of Huelva, which is one of such polity. These, uh, they're in two adjacent lots adding up to 2,150 square meters between Las Monjas Square and Mendez Nunez Street. Archaeologists have excavated some 90,000 ceramic fragments of indigenous Phoenician and Greek imported wares. Over 8,000 of those have been identified by type. And this pottery dates from the 10th to the early 8th centuries BC. Together with other recovered evidence at Wova, discoveries reveal a substantial industrial and commercial emporium on this site that lasted several centuries. Archaeologists estimate the proto-historic city of Wilva had over 25 acres, which is large for the Iberian Peninsula in that period. Radiocarbon dates on cattle bones and other dates on ceramic samples prove a chronology of several centuries from the 10th century BC. Manufacturing workshops were centers of incipient capitalist endeavor and made pottery, bowls, plates, craters, vases, and amphorae. Metal, 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 metal melting pots Casting nozzles and weights were made in other cap germinals, as were finely worked pieces of wood, including ship parts. Jewelry and trinkets for larger commercial consumption classes made pendants from fibulae and ankle bones. Jewelers made agate and ivory articles, and one workshop of the period 
specialized in jewelry of gold and silver. The old Welva Harbor was a major hub for the reception, manufacturing, and shipping of diverse products of different and distant origin. The Tartessus River is the present-day Tinto River and the Ligustine Lake to the joint estuary of the Odiel and Tinto Rivers flowing west and east of the Huelva Peninsula. And this brings us to Cadiz and Los Millares. Cadiz Kingdom began as a small town at Benalup Casas Viejas, close to the Andalusian coast in what is now the nature park of the Cork Oak Groves. In Spanish, that is Parque de los Alcornocales. The local features, the locale featured a lush environment of bright green trees, and these cork oak groves are strategically situated astride two routes to both the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. They are at the throat of a bridge between Europe and Africa, broken only by the narrow Strait of Gibraltar. Its geographic position, perfect climate, and suitability for agriculture have made this bridge important throughout much of prehistory and history. Here we have dolmen, megalithic tombs, dating back to 6,500 BP. They are constructed of three gigantic pieces of stone, one horizontal resting on two uprights, forming the entrance to a collective burial chamber that was then covered by earth. The dolmen de Menga near Antequera is the most spectacular example that has been discovered on the Iberian Peninsula. The Tuba del Gigante near El Gastor in Cadiz province is another example. Los Pillares was a Calcolithic ATC located 10 miles north of Almeria in the municipality of Santa Fe de Mondujar, Andalusia, Spain. The complex was in use from the end of the 6th millennium to the end of the 4th millennium BP and supported a thousand people. The site covers five acres and comprises three concentric lines of stone walls. The outer ring is the largest, running more than 650 feet with 19 bastions and a gate guarded by four works. Now, four smaller outlying stone forts guard the road to the site and there is an extensive cemetery of 80 passage grave trunes Radiocarbon dating is established that one wall collapsed and was rebuilt around 5025 BP. Bronze Age tombs from around 3900 BP have been found in the foothills of the Sierra de Gador at Almeria, just outside the remains of the walled ATC slash kingdom of Los Millares. Within the walls, there is evidence of groups of simple round dwellings and a large building used for copper smelting. And that brings us to the Bronze Age at 3200 BP. A cluster of simple dwellings lay inside the walls as well as one large building containing evidence of copper smelting, as we just saw. Pottery excavated from the site includes plain and decorated wares, including the symbol keramic bowls bearing oi oculus motifs. Similar designs appear on various carved stone tools found at the site. In the ATC stage of Los Millares, professional specialists in metallurgy smelted and poured copper. The Los Millares ATC became a kingdom dominating the Iberian Peninsula. The population of Los Millares was about a thousand in the time frame 5200 to 4300 BP. The labor evolved, involved in its construction, the larger volume of stones used, its geometric characteristics and sophisticated design prove its early ATC and then later kingdom status. At ATC, Los Millares featured 70 megalith tombs. At this time, the Bell Beaker traders arrived. As it evolved into a kingdom, its rulers were often at war with other similarly situated polities. By 3800 BP, these rulers lost out to those of El Agar. El Agar took the Los Millares territory and incorporated it as their own 
and it evolved into the contemporary culture of Vila Nova de São Pedro in nearby Portugal. In this warring states period, the masses of commoners abandoned the urban centers and sought new locales where they could farm in simple chieftain style communities. Simultaneously, there were other Iberian settlements undergoing the same problematic transition from ranking to class division. These include the settlement of Los Cilios and Cabrera. When the Lebanese Phoenician mercantilists arrived, they settled in Andalusia around 3100 BP, and they built factories and warehouses along the Mediterranean coastline near Cadiz, making it their gateway to the Atlantic. Roman adventuring mercantile caps eventually supplanted them, and there are the remains of the original, originally Phoenician factory seized by the interlo interloping Roman caps for the processing of garum fish paste. These can be seen at Bologna and another in the center of Cadiz under what is what was an old theater. Phoenicia became part of the Persian Empire and therefore so did their outposts on the Iberian coast. Eventually slave stage Greek mercantile capitalists sailed across the Mediterranean to southern Spain. And this brings us to the Carthaginians from 600 to 300 BC. Carthaginians from North Africa arrived in southern Spain monopolizing western Mediterranean trading routes and along the way destroyed the city of Tartessos. The Carthaginian Empire thereby made its base in Spain permanent. The indigenous Iberian polities reacted to the Phoenicians and then the Greeks by adopting their values and technologies. The process of assimilation gathered pace, drawing all classes into the transformation between 700 and 550 BC. New privateering adventurers challenged the establishment classes, demanding and getting a piece of the action. These traces can be seen in rich tombs around Carmona and cemeteries such as El Asebuja and Setevilla and in Huelva at the cemetery of La Jolla. New glass wealth from La Jolla included a chariot of walnut wood, an ivory casket with silver hinges, bronze mirrors, tiered incense burners, and ornate libation jugs. Gold jewelry is known from many spectacular treasures in southern Spain, of which the regalia from El Carambolo in Sevilla and the mixture of jewels, engraved scarabs, and tableware of silver and glass from Alaceda in Caceres are good examples. Glass and ivory were imported, but the impressive gold work of filigree and granulation was probably Western Phoenician craftsmanship. By 550 BC, the Iberian culture began to take on its modern appearance throughout the entire south and east of the peninsula. That remained distinctive through its incorporation into the Roman Empire. And the Iberian stage of slavery had an urban base with cities arising after 600 BC. They were especially large and numerous in western Andalusia at Ategua, Castulo, Ibros, Osuna, Tejada, La Vieja, and Torre Paradones. Later, the urban revolution featured cities at the other end of the Iberian world in northeastern Spain at Calacete, that is Teruel, Olardola, Tavisa, or what's now Tarragona, and Ullastret, which is now Girona. Cities were politically centers with territories, and some joined into confederacy, while others were independent city-state kingdoms, and remained so. The urban heartland in western Andusia uh, prospered uninterrupted, uninterruptedly from 550 BC, but many towns in southern and eastern Spain were destroyed in the middle of the 4th century amid political turbulence arising from class war. Now a little more on the mode of production. The Iberian economy continued to be based on gra grain agriculture supplemented with cultivated grapes and olives. Ironworking and iron was used everywhere for basic agricultural tools 
by 400 BC. Forging inlaid and damascened weapons brought the blacksmith's art to a peak. The fast potter's wheel allowed mass production of crockery and storage vessels for lat latifundia as well as for free farmers. There were many regional centers of production and the artistic repertoire grew from geometric designs in the early stages to complex figurative compositions after 300 BC. Factories arose at Arcana, Elks or Elke, Lyria and Azalea. Their, artis their artisans depicted scenes from Iberian myth and legend. Mining for silver at the Tinto River expanded up the Guadalquivir Valley to the area around Castulo and to the coast around Cartagena, and the scale of extraction at the Tinto River left more than six million tons of silver slag alone. Silver was abundant in Iberian society, being widely used for tableware among the upper classes. An outstanding treasure from Tevisa has dishes engraved with religious themes. Temples at the Cerro de los Santos at Abacete and Cigarra Lejo at Murcia have hundreds of stone, human, and horse figurines, respectively. Bronze was favored for statuettes at the sanctuary of Despeñaperos in Ayen, striking funerary sculptures of enthroned ladies, bejeweled and robed from Elks and Baza, representing the Carthaginian goddess Astarte, whose throne has a cavity for cremations. There were three writing systems in Iberia. One, an alphabet derived from Phoenician signs, was being used in the southwest by 650 BC. Two, Greek alphabets were used in the southeast and in Catalonia after 425 BC. And three, there's an undeciphered alphabet used for letters inscribed on rolled up lead sheets found in houses at Valencia and Ullastret. In the interior of Spain to the west and north, iron was used from 700 BC. People who lived in small villages practiced grain agriculture and animal herding economies. In the northwest, agriculturalists lived in fortified compounds called castros. The interior people were divided into dozens of independent territories, leaving behind hundreds of place names. Celts lived on, or Celts, whichever pronunciation you prefer, lived on the central Mesetis in direct contact with the Iberians. They adopted Iberian technology, including wheel-made pottery, and made rough stone sculptures of pigs and bulls. They used the Eastern Iberian alphabet for inscriptions on coins and on the bronze plaque from Saragossa. By 150 BC, they built urban settlements. Metalworking flourished with distinctive neck rings, or torques, of silver or gold, along with brooches and bangles. In the, Med the Mediterranean way of life reached the interior after the Romans conquered Numantia in 133 BC and Asturias in 19 BC. This brings us to Rome branding Iberia. Understanding the Roman imposition of its own brand of slavery onto Iberia requires class analysis of the Roman army through time. The first period featured the years from Rome's first advances into Spain in its adventure against Carthage until the reform of Gaius Marius in the army in 107 BC. Then the legions had a character not much changed from the days when Rome was an advanced theocratic chieftain. That is to say, the legions were not permanent units and were instead created, used, and disbanded. In its TONE, that is, Table of Organization and Equipment, a Republican era legion was based on the Greek and Macedonian phalanx of spear and sword shield wall soldiery. Anyway, legions could be recalled again as needed, and this system, system proved inefficient and insufficient and evolved into the second period wherein the Republican legions were composed of permanent bodies of men levied for enlistment periods and required to pay for their own equipment. Thereafter, the officers and men structure of the Roman army 
reflected the extant slave-based society. At the top, there were two ruling consuls with four consular legions between them. In time of war, extra legions could be levied, and since the Roman slave stage was based on constant warfare, so was the conscription of new soldiery constant. By the time of Gaius Marius, Rome was experiencing manpower shortages. Property and financial qualifications to join the army further hampered getting men willing to die as a way of life. This created the perfect storm of social revolt in Italy, upon which the richest man in the city, Gaius Marius, was able to recruit support for massive military reorganization known to scholars as the Marian reforms of 107 BC. Now the size of the legion varied. In the first and second periods, troops provided their own equipment. In the post-Marian reform, Republican period, when the army became professional, the infantry was split into ten cohorts, each of four maniples of 120 legionaries. legionaries. Now later the legions would have 5,200 Roman men plus 120 auxiliaries it split into ten cohorts, nine of 480 men each, plus the first cohort holding 800 men. Now, First Consul Gaius Marius removed property qualifications and decreed that all citizens, regardless of their wealth or social class, were made eligible for service in the Roman army. The government would pay soldiers and supply their equipment. As important, the government would pay bonuses for years of service and for valorous deeds. The Roman army had become a volunteer, professional, and standing army. It now extended service beyond Roman citizens to non-citizens that signed on as auxiliaries, or what they, were, they called auxilia, and were rewarded Roman citizenship upon completion of service with all the rights and privileges that that entailed. In the time of Augustus, there were nearly 50 legions but this was reduced to about 25 to 35 permanent standing legions, depending on Rome's financial resources of the moment. Now this remained the count until the expense of keeping the slaves in chains, not to mention the colonial territories in subjugation, got too great. Then the soldiery and the legions stopped volunteering for more foreign adventures. They were opting to stay in Gaul, or Iberia, or even Britain as they could see little profit in returning to Italy where their farms had been absorbed by the Latifundista class. This trifecta was the perfect storm that convinced the ruling classes of Rome to chuck it all and move to Constantinople. Now back at the ranch, Carthage lost control of Sicily and Sardinia after the First Punic War. A dispute over Saguntum, which Hannibal had seized, led to a second war between Rome and Carthage. The Roman slavocrats had originally intended to take the war to Spain on their own initiative. In the event, however, they were forced to do so by defensively to prevent Carthaginian reinforcements from reaching Hannibal after his rapid invasion of Italy. Roman generals had success in conquering large sections of Spain before a disastrous defeat in 211 BC forced them back to the Ebro River. In 210 BC, Scipio Africanus resumed Rome's efforts to remove the Carthaginians from Spain, which was achieved following the defeat of the Carthaginian armies at Bacula, or Belen, in 208 BC, and Alipa, which is now Alcala del Rio near Sevilla, in 207 BC. Scipio returned to Rome where he held the consulship in 205 BC and went on to defeat Hannibal at Zama in northern Africa in 202 BC. After the expulsion of the Carthaginians from Spain, the Romans controlled only that part of the peninsula affected by the war, namely the eastern seaboard and the valley of the river Guadalquivir. Over the next 30 years, the Romans fought continuously against Iberian tribes of the northeast the Celtiberians in northern Meseta, and against the Lusitanians in the west. Rome divided Iberia, uh, divided Iberia into two military areas, or provinciae, 
of nearer and further Spain. In Spanish, the España Citerior and España Ulterior. In 197 BC, elected magistrates, or praetors, were set for two-year periods to command the army district. After the campaigns of Tiberius, Sempronius, Gracchus, and Lucius Postumius Albinus in 180 to 178 BC, treaties were made with the Celtiberians and others. In 150 BC was a period when Rome was not occupied by fighting in the eastern Mediterranean or Africa. However, large-scale wars broke out in Celtiberia, in the western part of Beseta, and in Lusitania. Rome sent a series of consuls to Spain. Nevertheless, fighting continued sporadically for the next two decades. In 137 BC, an entire army commanded by the consul Gaius Hostilius Mancinus was forced to surrender to the Celtiberians. The war against the Lusitanians was ended only by the assassination of their leader, Viriathus, in 139 BC. And then the Celtiberians were subdued in 133 BC. The defeat of the Celtiberians occupied with, uh, occurred with the capture of their main town, Numantia, which is now Soria, after a prolonged siege conducted by Publius Scipio Aemilianus, the grandson, by adoption of Hannibal's opponent. In the first century BC, Spain was involved in civil wars of the Roman world. In 82 BC, after Lucius Cornelius Sulla captured Rome, or Sulla captured Rome from the supporters of deceased Gaius Marius, the Marian governor of nearer Spain, Quintus Sertorius, relying on local Spanish communities, won. He defeated attempts of two Roman commanders, Quintus Metellus Pius and the young Pompey, to regain control of the peninsula. However, Sertorius' assassination in 72 BC resulted in the collapse of his cause. During the wars between Julius Caesar and Pompey, Caesar rapidly secured Spain by a victory over the Pompeians at, Yer, at uh, what's now Yeda. After Pompey's murder in Egypt in 48 BC, his sons, Gennaeus and Sextus Pompey, raised the south of the peninsula. They posed a serious threat until Julius Caesar defeated Gennaeus at the Battle of Munda in present-day Sevilla province in 45 BC. Augustus, after the defeat of Mark Anthony at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, became master of the entire Roman Empire and completed the military conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. The last area, the Cantabrian Mountains in the north, took from 26 to 19 BC to subdue and required the attention of Augustus himself in both 26 and 25 BC. He used his best general, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, to do that in 19 BC, and then the peninsula was divided into three provinces. Batica with its provincial, provincial capital at Cordova, Lusitania with its capital at Merida, and Terraconensis based on Tarragona. There had been uh, migration from Italy to the silver mining areas in the south. In Catalonia, Roman Latifundia owners were producing wine for export at Badalona, but it was not until the period of Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus that full-scale Roman-style colonia were established. This was done for the benefit of Roman legionary veterans. Some colonia were built in already existing native towns, such as at Taraco. Others were built on more or less virgin land, such as at Emerita Augusta. By the early first century AD, there were nine such foundations by Etica, eight in Terraconensis, and five in Lusitania. An inscription from Colonia Genitiva Julia at Osuna shows a community of Roman citizens with their own magistrates and religious officials, a town council, and common land assigned to the town. The most important feature is the recognition by Rome of the critical role of the army, and therefore its veterans, as the main state pillar of the empire. During the reign of Augustus, 
and through the period up to the overthrow of the Emperor Nero in AD 68, Iberian towns began to model themselves on the Roman pattern. In this they constructed public buildings, including a forum, and buildings for local government, temples, and bathhouses. The upper classes of the towns and cities of Spain were part of the elite of the Roman Empire as a whole in the first century AD. And a number of Roman senators were natives of Spain, including Trajan and Hadrian, who later became emperors, uh, AD 98-117 and AD 117-138, respectively, and both of them came from Italica. The same period saw a progressive reduction in the number of Roman troops stationed in the peninsula. During the Cantabrian War under Augustus, the number of legions rose to seven or eight, but those were reduced by three to three by the reign of his successor Tiberius, and to one by the time of Galba's succession. From Vespasian's time to the end of the empire, the legionary force in Spain was limited to the 7th Gemini Felix Legion stationed at Leon in the north. That legion and the other auxiliary units in Spain were recruited from the peninsula. Recruits from Spain served throughout the Roman world, from Britain to Syria. From the time of Vespasian onward, military activity in Spain was restricted in scope to such things as the repulsion of an attack by the Berbers from Africa in the AD 170s. Raids by barbarians during the chaotic period of the late AD 300s um, hastened the last gasp of the Roman Empire West. It seems probable that Legion 7 Gemini was split into the late uh, into the third in the late third or fourth century AD, with one part being transferred to the Comitatensis, the mobile field army that accompanied the emperor. The permanent forces remaining in Spain were reduced by the removal of soldiers to fight in the civil war that followed the attempt by the usurper Constantine to seize power from the emperor. Honorius in AD 406. Massive slave revolts accompanied by these increasing costs of war in their extra Italian holdings convinced the ruling families of Spain that the great increases in the cost of the army, that is the state, required an at bottom solution. Therefore, they decided to switch their headquarters from Rome to Constantinople and the Roman Empire West collapsed. And that brings us to a conclusion of this lecture on the slave stage in Italy. In the next lecture, we will move on to the slave stage in France.